I'm so excited about this book, and I really want to begin by asking, what is the origin of the book? Because as I read the book, it's a kind of network of case studies that are linked thematically, conceptually. But I'm wondering, where was the, what's the origin? Where did it begin? Um, OK, that's a good question. Um, it kind of began with grief. Uh, the book begins with the sort of narrative of the loss of a friend. Um, and in the immediate aftermath of the loss of that friend, who was also my teacher, um, to be honest, I was sort of just desperately looking for a way to continue to talk to that friend. Um, and so I did what a student might do, which is to start writing. Um, and in the middle of the book, there's a chapter on the work of the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres. And in the first couple of weeks after my friend's death, um, I returned to Gonzalez Torres's work. And that was why um, I had gone to study with my friend. He had written about that artist. Um, and I had, in graduate school, written a number of seminar papers about that artist. Uh, there was a dissertation chapter that became one of my first publications. But I never really felt like I had said what I wanted to say to my teacher about that artist. So in the absence of his presence, um, I started to write about Felix Gonzalez Torres. Mm -hmm. And that eventually became what was the third chapter. But uh, the original drafts um, uh, were unwieldy and wild, and there was no real shape to them. I knew that there was a kind of argument about the materialization of a kind of communism through the aesthetic, yeah. um, but I didn't quite know how that was going to manifest. So um, for months I just wrote, and it was grief writing. I think the first draft of that chapter was 80 pages. It had long, long sort of like um, rabbit holes into Rosa Luxemburg and all of these other figures. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of an amorphous thing. Um, and simultaneously, because I was in a grieving process, and it wasn't just my teacher, um, who we'll talk about in a moment, Jose Munoz, but um, I'd also lost another friend earlier that year, um, Sam uh, Pedraza, who I, I speak about in the first chapter. Um, and s sort of working through the loss of them, I was spending a lot of time going to artwork, uh, which I guess my therapy. And uh, I started spending a lot of time with the work of the artist Jan Vo. Um, who became the second chapter in the book. And Jan's work um, often deals with um, objects that are kind of haunted by histories, whether it's the histories of the Vietnam War or the histories of the AIDS crisis, um, various people we've lost. So uh, just within a year of these two losses, I was simultaneously writing about Jan and Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, thinking about ways that we can bring alternative forms of collectivity and being in the world while also carrying with us our dead. Um, and both Felix and Jan were coming from um, refugee positions, from minoritarian positions as a Cuban-American artist and as a Vietnamese uh, Danish artist. Um, uh, both of them were, are queer, right? Um, and so both of them were working at the transection of a number of forms of mass loss, whether it is displacement and diaspora because of revolution and the failures of revolution. Um, or whether uh, it is uh, you know, because of the Vietnam War um, and the subsequent tragedies that followed that. Um, so within a year, I had those two chapters. And then things started to become a little bit clearer, which is that I realized what I was really trying to write about um, was not just collectivity and communism, but like the specific role that the aesthetic plays in facilitating forms of collectivity um, and in facilitating the, um, a kind of collectivity that doesn't abandon our dead, right? So what would it be like to have a kind of communism that doesn't um, leave our dead behind but carries them with us and attends to what their needs are? Um, uh, and, and from that, the rest of the book just sort of uh, un unfolded. Um, I, I'm not joking in the introduction when I say that it's kind of a diary of the places that I took refuge in to survive my friend's losses. So I was gravitating during this period of mourning to work that often dealt with mourning. So um, I started to attend the solo performance work of Eko um, Otake, who is part of the, uh, often more known for her work as part of the dance duo Eko and Koma. Um, I was doing that with one of my former teachers, Karen Shimakawa, who I mentioned in the text. Um, and she and I were writing about Eko together, and, and some of those ideas in that chapter emerged from that collaboration um, with her permission. Um, uh, uh, I started gravitating towards the work of the artist Seng Kuang Chi, and not just Kuang Chi's work, but in particular, his, his, he died of AIDS 
um, during the first wave of the crisis, and his sister played this massive role in keeping his work alive. So I became really attached to his sister, Muna, her work both as an archivist of her brother's loss, but also as an artist in her own right. Um, uh, and sort of a long-standing through line in my life has always been Nina Simone. Um, and it was sort of about halfway through writing the book that I, 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 my friend Riley for a long time had been like, you should write about Nina Simone. And I was always like, I'm not ready, right? And there was something about in the depths of my own losses, um, listening to her recordings in this period when she lost a number of friends. And it was all queer community, so it was Lorraine Hansberry, Langston Hughes. Um, uh, and as she responded to that, and eventually Dr. King, um, as she was responding to those losses, that just was resonating a lot. And so that became the kind of ground for that chapter. So the kind of summary answer is, uh, I wasn't joking when I said it really was a kind of two or three places that I took refuge in, which is why they look so disparate. Um, uh, but they made a lot of conceptual sense to me because each one of them was deeply invested, each one of these artists was deeply invested in two kind of movements. On the one hand, working through grief, right, to keep the dead alive. And on the other hand, creating, using the aesthetic to create a grounds for a kind of collectivity that is politically activated, right? And whether it was Simone in the struggles for black life in the mid-century, um, Gonzalez Torres um, during the um, uh, height of the first wave of the AIDS crisis, or Jan, you know, sort of in its aftermath, um, uh, Eiko after Fukushima, um, saying, during the sort of rise of a new right in the 1980s, which culminates in the uh, first wave of the AIDS crisis. These were all sites that were thinking about that question. And so it seemed to make sense to me that they were hanging out <laughs> in the same room, even though they seemed odd. And that, it, that oddness also made sense to me insofar as my teacher, Jose, um, thought disparately. He thought conceptually, and he taught us to think that way. So there, there was nothing odd about putting Nina Simone next to Felix Gonzalez Torres. It was more why haven't we had these two people sitting next to each other all along? Because, you know, kind of like Carol Churchill's Top Girls, it makes perfect sense to be at this dinner party where everyone's talking. Right, right. and the, the book uses the party in two senses, the, the Communist Party, yeah. but also the literal parties that Jose Munoz used to throw. Yeah. And in a sense, the, the book is a kind of party in a sense, as you've just described. You're bringing together these disparate people, and the container is this book and one of the through lines that links these uh, disparate points of discussion, of refuge, is Jose Munoz and his life and his work. Yeah. Could you say a little bit about his impact, the impact of his life and work on your life and work? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, some of it's there on the page, which is just, um, when I went to, I started grad school when I was, I want to say 23 years old, 24 years old. Um, uh, this is like around 2002, 2003. Um, something that's just emerging or that came up when writing this book is I turned 35 as I was sort of getting close to finishing that book. And um, I grew up like, I, you know, as a teenager in the 1990s when the life expectancy uh, for queer men of color was around 35. So the truth is I just sort of like, even though um, I sort of look the way I do, I just sort of had always assumed I wasn't gonna make it to 35, so it was kind of surprising to me when I did. Um, and one of the reasons that I think I did make it to 35 was because of um, his friendship and mentorship, that I didn't really have a place in the world um, and that I was really quite lost in the world. And when I went to study with him, he sort of opened up a world of thinking and ideas in which um, the weirdos and the misfits could not only have a place, but could actually like have something to say, right? Um, so just on a personal level, I think the re one of the reasons that I'm alive is because of a kind of quite conscious joint endeavor on the part of my teacher and, frankly, my mother, uh, who uh, sort of both worked to keep this weird, awkward 20-something who didn't know how to be alive, alive, right? Um, so that's the kind of personal uh, impact, which is also why losing someone like that is destabilizing. It kind of undoes a person. Um, when I went to study with him, it was because disidentifications had been published a few years earlier. And um, I think for a lot of us, that text uh, uh, not only pioneered sort of new ways of thinking, but also gave voice to a way of thinking in the world um, as people of color, as queers, um, that like just needed to be on the page, 
right? Like, and, and, it had, it, and it was drawing together an already existing conversation, right? Across the work of people like Ansaldua um, and, uh, uh, you know, like Bell Hooks and all of these sort of women of color feminists and queer women of color feminists, um, many of them, had been the sort of foundation for his work. But disidentifications just sort of, uh, it opened up a space of potentiality and thought that, that um, for like 19 year old me in, in uh, 1999 when the book came out, was just sort of life changing. So I was either going to do that or become a high school teacher in the Bronx. Those were my two options, was going to grad school or becoming a high school teacher in the Bronx. And he convinced me, he was like, you can always go back and be a high school teacher in the Bronx, but like, why don't you come and like, read some Ernst Block with me right now? And I was like, sure, I'll do that. Uh, Joshua, this is your second Outstanding Book Award, which is in itself pretty amazing to me. Uh, I think this book is, uh, it's, it's beautiful, it's intellectually engaged. I, I found it astonishing from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you could say a little bit about writing, your writing process and how you mentor students in their writing. I love working with students, both undergrad and grad, but I have to say like one of the greatest pleasures is working with grad students and watch them start um, in their first year and then seeing where they are on the day of the defense, right? Because it's always this thing where it's like, wow, you've grown into yourself, you know? Um, and I think as a teacher, I try really hard to get out of their way to some extent uh, and try to be kind of like diagnostic, which is what are you trying to do? And this is what I think you want to do, to do what you want to do, but not to tell them how to be like any of us, right? Like right. not to replicate us on the faculty. So uh, generally what I tell, uh, my students, my graduate advisees, is um, like one, play with it a lot. Like just sit with the idea and play with it. Enjoy what it is to actually play with the thought. Don't let the super ego of the profession overdetermine the thought, right? Um, take seriously the fact that like pursuing this thought may not get you a job. It may be the kind of dissertation that isn't going to get you a job. And I'll let you know that, but if you want to pursue that line, you should do it because like it's the thought that's calling you, right? right. Um, uh, and I've told students in the past, like, I don't think, that, like, I don't think that this will get you a job. It's too weird, and uh, but I still think you should do it. And you know, <laughs> one of those students just defended and is heading off to a postdoc at Princeton. She's amazing, um, uh, and, but and part of it was because she was like, well, I just followed the the idea. So uh, the first advice is like, it's not very good advice professionally, which is like. Um, we all come into this gig for some kind of reason. Like people don't become committed to studying a topic for years and years, uh, being told constantly that you're not doing it right, uh, being told constantly that it's not what the world needs or wants, or that you know, it's that all of the sort of just criticism. It breaks. Like we don't go into that because we don't have some kind of like internal core commitment to the practice of thinking and writing. Um, so the thing I try to tell people most of all is sort of commit yourself to that practice, to the actual intellectual practice that brought you here and recognize that that has risks, right? That, it, um, that uh, following, um, I don't know, it sounds very cheesy and opery, but like following your intellectual truth uh, is going to produce better work, but it may not be work that is well received. And so like the capaciousness mm. of after the party was about following every lead to where it might go. And suddenly you have a really weird world in which Echo, Felix, Jan, um, Nina, Sang, and Jose are all hanging out with each other in the same book. Yeah. Um, and Karl Marx and Fred Mosin. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, the short of it is like, uh, uh, I think we're often told not to think in certain ways, and, and Moton's a great example. I remember, now I'm just talking, this is not good for interview. I, I remember right after graduate school um, uh, doing my postdoc, and the other person doing their postdoc uh, was a Marx scholar. And so I was like, you've got to read this book in the break. Um, and the other person was just like, I think he got Marx wrong. And I was like, first of all, you're wrong. Second of all, <laughs> like, what would it matter if you got it wrong and you produced this thinking? And he was like, oh, that's a fair point, right? This was a kind of like over drinks debate, but that is kind of at the core of what I try to say with other students, which is like, you know, be heretical, be weird in your thinking, but like follow your intellectual truth. You came here for a reason. I do think that all scholarship is activist scholarship, whether we believe it or not, mm -hmm. you know, so commit yourself to your practice um, and, 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 you know, and 
at the very least, you won't have to apologize for your own ideas, right? Mm -hmm. That said, it's still hard work. So this is the thing that one often encounters with students is students are like, I have the ideas, and I'm like, you do, and you totally have the passion. What you don't have the, is the technique yet, right? So like hone your technique. And I think one of the biggest differences between after the party and a race so different is that for me, a race so different was about learning a particular kind of technique, a particular kind of scholarly technique. Some of the more writerly um, experiments that I make in after the party, uh, I even tried making in my dissertation, which is what became a race so different. And I had Jose there as my advisor saying, like, this doesn't work, or you're not pulling this off, or this isn't funny. You think it's funny, but it seems flip. And it's mm. like, right, this, you think this is personal, but it actually seems narcissistic. Um, so that, to me, writing after the party was, or uh, a race so different was very much about learning technique as a writer and a scholar. And once I had done some of that for after the party, I could start playing with, say, voice, and being like, what does it mean to, to write to the audience member directly as you? Or what would it mean to uh, pull Marx's dissertation into this chapter about Sang Kwang Chi, where I'm talking about like basically queer hookup culture, um, but that one has to really study and practice and learn how to do those things. And one of the ways you do that is by reading a ton. The other is by experimenting with the writing, and then the third is by having some degree of humility, so that when you're not pulling it off, yeah. or when you don't know what you need to know to write it, you can just say, "I'm not ready for this yet. I have to come back to it," and that might mean that the more experimental, playful, exciting thinking that you want to do is going to take time. But that's one of the pleasures of being a scholar, is it's one of the rare jobs in the world where even though we're being asked to produce at a rate that is stupid, um, we are still given time. Like a six-year clock on the 10-year clock for those who are in 10-year stream employment, or the five to 10 years that it can take to produce a book or a dissertation, like we should celebrate that. And as schools and departments are asking people to produce more, it, it's maddening because it's like, no, like what one can produce in 10 years in thinking and writing and the technique one can develop, that's huge. And it's something that not a lot of fields have the privilege and the pleasure to be able to do. And increasingly, our field doesn't, and the labor conditions in our field foreclose that.